the syntax error test cases, then your parser is not uh, parsing it correctly. So if we get, let's say, 2s, Yes, it's got to be 100%, because that's the basis of everything, right? If your parser doesn't work, then how do you type check? So, wow. You can still get 50. Yeah. It says 5%. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than zero. Yeah. It says five points extra credit for implementing the parsing for case, case list, and switch statement. However, yes. there's the parsing, but then there's also the type checking for those things. Correct. So is there also extra credit for type checking case? It's, it's, these are all the same. So you have to implement it fully, right? You have to parse it, you have to type so check. So if I it. only do the parsing, do I get two of the five points? It says two out of two. I guess. No, it wouldn't be two of the, uh, yeah, it would be. Okay. Uh, well, the other one's out of six. Actually, did you, pass, extra credit out did of you six. pass all the syntax cases for Yes, that? but I didn't pass all the extra credit cases. Then yes. Then I guess, yeah, you get two points for doing the parsing. Okay, I see what you're doing. But yeah, but you didn't do the type checking on these, right? So this is, like, I guess it's implementing parsing and doing all of these, right? So. Okay. Yeah. Calling the syntax error function. Yeah, yeah. Then that's fine. Yeah. Yes. So uh, wait, before you answer this, let me make sure this is recording correctly. Actually, I don't know how to check now. <laughs> uh, a claim has been made that if you don't pass all of the 15 for type error 3, you get none of the 60 points. Is oh, it's true? just like before. You get percentage okay. based off of the total, right? So. Okay. Thank you. All of it's worth 60 points. If you pass whatever, 50% of the test cases, then you'll get 30 points. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. Project four questions. Yeah. Are we modify Yes. You can modify whatever you want. You can. Yes. You got free reign to do whatever you want, as long as it's like still working, right? So. Yeah. And then I have one more question. Mm -hmm. Purpose of printing out the line number? To find your error. Yeah, to find the error, right? So, like, if you're a human and you you run your code and it says, "Hey, there's this type error on line four, How are you, as a human, going to know which line to look at? You look at line four, right? You go have four new lines in the program. You go down. That's the line, right? So it doesn't matter statements or anything like that, right? It's not saying you have a problem in this statement here. Uh, so that's why you should just use the line number that's already there in the in the program. So you shouldn't have to do anything extra for that. It's just, uh, and the other answer of why are we also printing out the line number, well, it's also because it, you have to actually implement it, right? Otherwise, you could just say there's a type error somewhere, and you'd be right some percentage of the time. So you know, here you have to say exactly what line it's on. So it would be more precise. Other questions? We can talk, we can spend a little bit of time talking about project four. Except for me, no. <laughs> so the expression, um, an expression contains uh, pieces of information, the left operand and the right operand. Mm -hmm. I never see in your parser that you set, I've printed it out to figure out how um, it stores things. Mm -hmm. To the left is the first number. If you have like D equals seven plus six plus five plus four, mm -hmm. to the left will be the seven, then you go again, and then it will be the six, then you go again, and then it will be the five, but I never see where you set the right operand um, equal. So the right operand is going to equal a number instead of an expression at some point, right? It's going to equal a primary instead right. of an expression at some right. point. 
um, it is that in the type. So like you know how the expression node has a type. What what gets set in the expression node when it's parsing? So it's kind of you kind of ask him what is the what does the code look like, right? How yeah, it's like if I write a recursive method to traverse mm -hmm. that, and then I get to type yeah. uh, that's a primary, that's when I stop and start building it back up. I guess uh, it's whatever the parser does, right? So you have to look at how it's parsing. You have to look at that case. So when does it terminate, right? When does that parser, the expression parsing, stop? And remember, um, so uh, x, b, r. Right, so here there's actually a lot more involved. This is just to get the um, uh, to get the precedence right here. Uh, so we have expressions and then terms and then factors. Because you never parse term or factor. Right, they're rolled up and considered expressions basically. Yes. Yeah. Right, but there are functions for parse factor and parse term, right? There's a there's a function called factor and a function called term. So it would almost be like maybe where this factor is where it's going to real number, num real number ID, probably something in there sets a flag that tells you what that thing returns, that it's one of those. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want to ask a question? We, we can keep doing this. Yeah. Uh, my last question is, if you have an mm. assigned statement. Are you sure it's your last question? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> it's fine if it's, your not, if it's not, you just don't want to make sweeping statements. My last to this class question. Okay. There's lots of questions. So like the assigned statement, uh, it has the ID and then it has the expression. Sure. And I, let's say the ID is not declared up top. Okay. Okay, so it's a general type. It's a non-constrained type. Implicit type. Implicit. There we go. There we go. If it's an implicit type. Correct. Um, actually, let's claim that it's an int. Okay. And then what this returns, the right side of the expression returns an implicit type. Okay. That means I have to go back in and go all the way down and find everything and set them all to int. If I had a plus b plus c plus d plus e plus f plus h plus i, so is that and they're have, all implicit, and then they all equal the assigned. Is that what you have to do when you're doing the Hindi Milner type checking? Yes. If they're all implicit, then they They're all going to be the same type. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The question is, do you have to traverse down into the expressions again? That's up to you. I mean, are you keeping track of? Because if I use A again somewhere else in the program, it right. must be in it. Right, so where's the type of A declared? In that expression no. chain that's going crazy. No, no, so there's got to be a type for every variable in your program, right? When you get to a. Not if it's implicit. Why? It it's just, just showed a, up. Yeah, it's a new type. You have a new, a new variable with a new type. But I don't. It'll be just the same thing as explicitly declaring it with a type that does that is not a built-in, right? With a new name. So you should be able to create in whatever you're keeping track of the variables and their types. You should be able to create. Hey, I saw this variable A, and it has this type. And its type is generic. Great. As long as I mean, it's a new fresh. type. It's a new type. But it's not then, generic. It's a new type. Yes. And then once I get to the bottom and I start coming up, once I start coming right. up. Then all of a sudden I've lost that I was there once, and then I need to go back again. So it's all about the constraints, right? So we have the constraints of our type system here, right? So you're saying that, um, where is it, the assignment? Uh, basically, so assignments cannot be made between variables of different types. So what's another way of saying this? Yeah, the types must match, right? The left-hand side yeah. type has to match the right-hand side type. Exactly. exactly. But the right-hand side could be an expression that's like n length. Great. What's the type of that expression? If they're all um, new types, Great. and this is an int, then all Then what constraint do you have now? What constraint do you know? That that's an int. Perfect. All these are ints. There you go. And so if you see any of those implicit, that same variable again, which has that same implicit type, right? then you know it's got to be an int. And if it ever occurs where it's not an int, Yes, but how do I implement that? Is <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> <laughs> I know that that must that's, that's what you have to do, yeah. So you have to, you should be keeping track of the variables and the types of the variables in your program, right? Sure. And you yeah. can also keep track of, maybe let's say, declared types and current types, right? Like you could reduce every type maybe down to basic types if you can, or just like you did uh, when we did Hindi Milner, right? You, or Hindley Milner. You go through and you update and say, hey, all of type C or whatever, new type A, they're ints. 
And that way later when you see an A, you look up in your table and you see, oh, A is type A, which is an it. Perfect. Do you have any more questions? Anybody else have questions? Yeah. Um, would you say then that uh, it's easier to uh, do some of the type checking as if you're building the parse tree instead of just doing it all at the end of the parse tree? Does somebody else want to answer? <laughs> somebody did? Yeah. It's always easier to test smaller pieces of code and larger pieces of code than you can isolate where your errors are easily. Yeah, so you got to think about it. The, uh, the parsing functions, right? They're starting from the top, they're parsing the whole thing. I mean, you can do it this way, right? And this is how, if you're doing it, let's say, as a real, as part of a real compiler, I would separate the parsing from the type checking, right? I'd have parsing, and then I'd have type checking, type checking the entire structure. Um, but for something like this, right, it's going to be a lot easier uh, to do the type checking while you're doing parsing. But you have to be very careful in that you need to, you need to type check when you have enough information to type check. Does that make sense, right? So. Um, so for instance, if you're looking, so there's parsing function for all these, right? Does it make sense to, to type check an ID list? No. No, somebody said no, why not? You don't know this type at all, it's just names. Right, so an ID list is just ID comma, ID comma, ID comma, with no context. There's no types here, no nothing, right? So it doesn't really make sense to type check there. Uh, but what about maybe like a, a variable declaration? So why does it make sense to type check here? Yeah, because at here we've parsed. Okay, we know there's, so we're declaring variables, right? Explicitly declaring variables. And what are the names of those variables? That was dangerous. What are the names of the variables? Where do we find the names of the variables that we've just declared? In the ID list, right? Yeah. And by the time that um, we know we have a valid variable declaration, right? Um, when our variable declaration is valid, then we know we have a list of IDs and then we have a type name, right? So I can go through this ID list and I can get all of the variable names. I can declare those variables. And what type do all these variables have? Type, type, type name. Yeah, whatever type name is. And it's just in my data structure, I can just grab it. say for the stuff that's given to you, yes. Um, but you remember, we're not giving you a print condition or a print switch or a print while, right? So you have to write those. So if, if, if you write those correctly and parse it correctly, then you're fine. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like is it possible that you messed up the printing but the parsing is actually correct? Yeah, that's totally possible, right? But it should be fairly simple when you're printing it out to kind of eyeball it and know yes, that's correct or yes, that's not correct. Yeah. Just for debugging purposes. Just for debugging purposes, yeah. You should not print the, the tree out at all when you submit. Anything else? Yeah. Just out of curiosity, if you wanted to do it so that you had your parsing and your type checking separate, how mm -hmm. would you keep track of like line numbers? So if you try to do it separate, uh, do your type checking separate, how would you keep track of line numbers? <laughs> Yeah, so you could build them into the parse tree, right? So each of those nodes in the parse tree is like an expression. You could have what line number it's on. And then after the fact, you can say, oh, there's an error here with this expression. That means I can say exactly what line number it is. <coughs> yeah, so you're free to add. You can add more data to the, uh, to the parse tree structures if you want. You know, It's up to you to set those and make sure that they're valid. All right, anything else before we get on to the New material, yeah. Um, if you built your parser completely and you were to, you know, we ran, I ran all the test cases on all the test cases that are given to us, um, but I'm still getting two out of three on the syntax error. So, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to figure out where you're not parsing correctly if you're passing all the parsing cases. So it sounds like the parsing cases are checking syntax errors. 
Right. What, I'm, what I'm saying is I have all my test cases and I, I'm printing out my parse tree app with all nine test cases and it's passing for every single one. So I, I don't, and, but I'm still on like one of the submission. I don't know what to, to, to check from here on out. So, I mean, but the problem is, is that you're passing two out of the three syntax error checks, right? Exactly. So do any of the test cases would give you gross syntax error? No. No. So you gotta think, okay, what we gave you is correct, hopefully. Uh, in parsing the rest of the grammar. So that those syntax check correctly, so it's probably something in the code that you wrote that's not checking the syntax errors correctly. Or not calling the syntax error function like it should. So you can you can create that, right? You have the grammar right here. Create if it's while statement, create a grammar with a while statement that doesn't follow this, right? So does that mean you're testing for like syntax errors within the test cases? I mean, yeah. There are, are invalid test cases called there? syntax errors. So I, yes. No, I mean the uh, like you're given an invalid program, it should, it should print out that. Yes. Yeah. If you're given an invalid program, it's got to print out a, part, a syntax error, right? Just like we've been doing on like the homeworks and the midterms, right? When you wrote a parser, you had to say when there's a syntax error, right? Just like here, because you can't type check a program that's not syntactically valid, so it's not a valid program. It doesn't matter if the type, it doesn't even make sense to ask the question, so it's not a valid program. Yeah? Uh, is it safe to say we, we won't have multiple syntax operations inside of expression? Uh, say that again? Uh, will we have multiple syntax operations inside of an expression? So like if you have uh, like an assignment statement D, where D is a new implicit variable, mm -hmm. um, and on the right hand side you have an expression, Is it disallowed? So what does it say about implicit variables, let's see. What does it say here? It appears in the body of the program. Yeah. Right, so where's the body of the program? Right? We have the program, we have our declarations in the body, the declarations are type declarations, the variable declarations, the body is everything. So yeah, it doesn't matter if it appears in a statement, condition, whatever. You see an ID that you've never seen before that doesn't exist in the declared variables, or it's not one you've seen already implicitly, it means it's a new implicit variable. It should have a new implicit type, or a new unique type. Yeah. 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 So types will not appear in the body, right? Types are what? Types will not appear in the body, it's just variables. What happens if types appear in the body as variables? Error. error, right? There's one of these errors. Four. Yeah, one of them is exactly, yeah, variable redeclared as a type name. Or variable. I don't think it will parse to try to put a type into the body. Uh, it won't parse if you put a built in type, but you could put to try to put a type name. If you'd use it as a variable, then that would be an error. All right. Hey, yeah, we'll get one more. We should. I, I don't know how to answer that. It's checking to make sure you're parsing correctly. So if, uh, if you're not doing it correctly, then you're accepting invalid programs or you're accepting valid programs. Like you're accepting things that shouldn't be accepted, or you're not accepting things that should be accepted. You can subdivide into a specific section, like you know, the type three errors. Is it reasonable to say you fail to if you keep a type three error when it wasn't one of those ones that all the, all those test cases are checking if it matches, if the output matches. Right? So either you're <coughs> You're specifying a type 3 error on the wrong line, that could be one issue. You're throwing a syntax error when there shouldn't be a syntax error, that would be another issue. Um, or you're saying one of the other type errors when it should be a type 3 error, and those other errors don't exist. So yeah, I can't, I don't know, I'm not. They're just tests, like, they're just like what you have. So there's a program and the expected output, and if it doesn't match, it doesn't match. All right, one more question. Extension? <laughs> Extension? Uh, highly likely not. <laughs> 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 yes. 
<laughs> Maybe do you really want to gamble on it, though? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead and call my bluff and see what happens on Wednesday. We have a very sad Thursday. Cool. Anything else? It's more about the content rather than craving or something like that. All right. One more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Is that one more question? It's a pointer. Or no? No, no. Okay, sorry. Oh. So we have like uh, an expression like A plus B, where both of them are like undeclared, like just implicit types. Yep. Is that okay? We don't know what types there. There's A plus B. Does it follow the, does it, uh, let's see, does it follow all the constraints? And then like if under that we say like A is equal to 1, then we would have to declare A as an integer of A. We're not declaring, you're inferring, right? Well, it's, inferring that it's an and then what does that say about the type of B? So then you have to show that as an integer of A. Yes, exactly. So then if B is later on used as a Boolean or something, right, then that would be a type error. Perfect. So yeah, so just like Hindley Milner, right? So you see an implicit variable, you give it a new type. Now, the only thing you know about that is it has to pass the constraints. And so in, a, um, in these operators, the only constraints that we have are they must be the same type. We don't know what those types are, but they must be the same types. So A and B have to have the same type. And then later on, if we see an assignment, we see, oh, they have to be assignments of the same type. So that means they have to both be integers. Yeah. So you said, I think at most that there was an error with one of the Correct. Cases. So if we had submitted prior to you changing that? Uh, they all got re-graded. So you should look. And if it didn't fix that one, then it wasn't that problem. But what if you'd already submitted it successfully prior to that? It's fine. It should work. For, it should work. Like, we just barely updated the test case to get rid of this weird scenario. So if we, we submitted it successfully, then we're fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, go check, make sure. But yeah, if there's any problems, email most of them. I thought I saw, I thought I saw another hand in this direction. Yep. All right, cool. Well, let's get back to the runtime environments. All right, so on Wednesday, we looked at the, here we're looking at the calling convention and specifically how arguments are passed from one function to another. Um, at using the stack at the uh, actual implementation level. Uh, so we saw a function main that calls a function callee with values uh, 10 and 40, takes that integer it gets back and then returns it. Um, callee just uh, takes A and B, adds them together, and then adds one to the result. Uh, so we actually looked at the assembly code, which we won't go into right now because we're gonna get into it in a second. Uh, but we saw that main has a bunch of code where essentially it's setting up and passing all the parameters onto the stack and calling callee, and then um, we talked about the prologue and the epilogue, then we looked at callee, and we saw that it had code like that. So um, just a slight recap, it's returning the value in EAX. Um, so looking at this bottom of the top, uh, it's adding one to what's in EAX. Here it's adding what's in EBX to EAX into there, and here it moves each of the arguments A and B into EAX and EBX. Um, so let's look at an example of what this code looks like, what exactly the stack looks like as this assembly code executes. Uh, so here we have the function, the, the callee function, the function that's going to get called. And here we have the main function. And so before we didn't worry about where this, this code actually was, but now because it's important to the semantics of call instructions and jump instructions, um, I gave each of these memory addresses, so these I ripped from um, I believe these were from the binary itself. So this is where GCC actually put them in memory. Uh, so for whatever reason, callee is like right above main or below, depending on how you look at it. OK, so then we have our handy dandy stack. Um, memory, the higher memory addresses are where on the stack? At the top, low addresses at the bottom. And we have our stack layout. Uh, so then we're going to look at only the registers that matter for this. So right now, we only really care about EAX, EDX, the stack pointer, the base pointer, and EIP. What's EIP? Structure. 
What was it? Instruction. Instruction pointer. What's in the instruction pointer? Yeah, so the, what's in EIP is the address of the next instruction to be executed. So a uh, little review from uh, your architecture class. It's like, so what happens when an instruction is executed? What was that? Somebody want to? Yeah. Well, it goes to the next instruction. But, so the processor fetches what's in the current instruction pointer. Right, decodes that as an instruction, then the CPU basically does some kind of execution depending on what that instruction is, right? Depending on if it's add two registers and put it in a third, it sets all that up, and then it increments the instruction pointer after that successfully executes to point to the next instruction. And of course, we have pipelining and all this kind of crazy stuff. Uh, all this stuff goes out of the window. And the thing I think I didn't mention, uh, you guys learned about or heard about microcode? Some of you? So your actual CPU, like uh, the CPU that's in all of your machines, if it's an x86 machine, it's not actually implementing and executing these instructions directly. Uh, it actually breaks them down into what's called microcode, which is specific to the processor, but that's what it actually executes on. So um, yeah, so hardware and architecture and all that stuff is way crazier than what you learned about in like MIPS classes. Uh, but from our point of view, from this, from this uh, this view of looking at x86 instructions, the, all of that complexity is abstracted from us. So we don't have to worry about that. We can just think about it at this uh, instruction level. Yeah? What's the difference between microcode and bytecode? Because I thought the next level down from the was bytecode. Uh, no. So bytecode, well, so bytecode I usually think of, it's usually referred to in terms of like a virtual machine, like Java or C Sharp. So like the bytecode is essentially the assembly language version of Java. So like a Java program gets compiled to a bunch of bytes, which are bytecode, but they're not x86 instructions. They don't execute directly on your hardware. There's a Java virtual machine that takes those instructions and executes it and essentially translates it into the underlying assembly language. Anything else? OK, cool. All right, so uh, let's just assume that our stack pointer before we get to main is somewhere here at the top of the stack. Uh, we'll give it a slightly more realistic-ish memory address than what we've been looking at before. Um, so then, so if I tell you this at the top of the stack, what does this mean about the registers? What do we know about the registers? Yeah. ESP points there. ESP points to what? When you say points to, what does that mean? Yeah, so that value FD2D4 is stored in ESP. And so really, um, this pointer of the stack is here comes from the fact that this value is in here. Right, so this, it's not just like I arbitrarily decided, it's like whatever this stack pointer was. Uh, so I don't know, in case you're wondering, I did take like a breakpoint at main, and this was where the stack pointer was, but there's a bunch of Fs before it, but that just like complicates, I mean, doesn't really add anything, right? Okay, so if we're about to execute um, the first instruction here, so before we execute the instruction, the value in the instruction pointer is gonna be the first instruction of main, right? So this is the instruction that's gonna be executed next. Okay, so where am I at now? Okay, got the instruction pointer. Um, do we know what anything about the, what's in the base pointer register? before main executes? Is there a real value in there or is there garbage in there? Garbage. Garbage, why garbage? Because we haven't moved the stack at all. So what's the, uh, the calling convention that we've been looking at, the C, C decal calling convention? Right, the call E does what? It sets the base pointer. Not only sets it, but before that, before it can set it, it saves it, right? Yeah, it has to save the base pointer because what's in this base pointer? What was it? Top of the current frame. 
uh, the top of, yeah, whoever called us frame. So this is the base pointer of whoever called us, right? So what do we know about that value? So is it above or below this FD2D4? Above, right? It's got to be above us because somebody else called us, so their frame pointer has got to be above us. Uh, so we know it's just something. Let's just say it's C0. That is above, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so yeah, we, so there is something in there. It is something important because it belongs to whoever called us. Uh, okay, so we are going to, uh, okay, so we're going to push EDP, oops, excuse me. Uh, so the, I went too far. Okay, so we're going to push EDP. So what's the first thing we do when we push something? What do we what? Yeah. We're going to put it onto the stack. How do we do that? I mean, it depends on the semantics, right? But so we're going to, um, we first move, we make room on the stack for our new value. So which way do we move the stack pointer? Down. 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 Yeah. So we first uh, decrement the stack pointer by four, uh, which then moves our little imaginary arrow down four bytes. Uh, and then we put that value. So we take whatever's in EBP and put it on the stack. Uh, which is FDC20. Okay, and then um, we, we move uh, the instruction pointer down to the next instruction because we just executed it. Um, so now we're pointed at this next instruction. So now we've completely finished executing that last instruction. Okay, now we're going to move the stack pointer into EDP. So what's this doing? Semantically. Yeah, it's setting the new base pointer. Whose new base pointer is it? For us. Yeah, exactly. For this function, right? It's setting our base pointer. So we say, okay, wherever the stack currently is, that's going to be our new base pointer. Uh, so we're going we're to um, copy FD2D0 into the base pointer. Yeah? Wait, why is it D0 not D4? Because uh, what, what changed the stack pointer? So what did this push instruction do? It pushed EBP onto the stack. Right, which moved did what to our stack pointer? Oh, it moved down. It moved it down, exactly, yeah. Didn't you, weren't you when you said it moved down? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you just gotta put it all together. Yeah, you're moving it down, right? So which means now it's permanently moved down. So now that's the current bottom most location of our stack. And then, so when we put ESP into EBP to set our base pointer, we can just copy that value over. So now they're both pointing at the same location, the stack pointer and the base pointer. Okay, then we subtract uh, hex 18, which I think we said before, what is that? It's uh, 24, so it's moving it 20, so it's moving the stack 24 down. Uh, so we do that, it's, let's see, let's say it's 2B8, I don't know, you can, somebody can verify, uh, which then is gonna move this pointer down how many square, how many of these squares? Six, yeah. So it's going to move. It's going to divide by four, right? So each of these is like an offset of four. So it's going to move it down to B eight. I hope I did this math right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So then we move on to the next instruction. Now we're going to move twenty eight into ESP plus four. So why a hex twenty eight? Forty. Forty. And what is forty important for? The variable, so we, uh, so yeah, it probably makes, so we were looking at the, the line of code is A is equal to callee uh, parentheses 10 and 40, where the actual parameters we're sending to callee is 10 and 40, right? So 40 is the second most parameter, so we know it goes higher up on the stack than um, the leftmost parameter, and this is what we know from the calling convention. So we're going to move the constant value 28 onto the stack pointer plus 4. Um, so the stack pointer plus 4 is uh, FD2BC. Then we copy the value 28 put it onto the stack there. Go on to the next instruction. Now we're going to move hex 10. What's hex 10 in decimal? Or hex A in decimal? 10. 10. Yeah, hex 10 in decimal is 16. 
to give you the wrong answer. Um, okay, yeah, so we're gonna move 10 onto the stack pointer. And we know where the stack pointer is, FD 2 b 8 uh, So that's gonna move that on there. So now what have we, what in essence have these two instructions done? Provided the parameters for the call we pointed. Yeah, so they're providing the parameters. So in essence, these pushed those values onto the stack, right? They essentially did a push OX28 and a push OXA. Um, but for whatever reason, the compiler just decided to kind of make the space there and just put them directly onto the stack. Okay. So what are the semantics of the call instruction? What does the call instruction do? Yeah. I'm sorry, I have a question. Sure. Um, you don't have to be sorry. The stack, is, is that a typo or am I just not understanding it? Is it supposed to be FD2C0? This is the value that's on the stack at location FD2D0. And where did, where did you get that number from? That number was what happened to be in EDP when main got called. So this is the saved base pointer. So this first instruction here was EDP. So uh, uh, this is just kind of like a, uh, to be 100% honest, I'm not entirely sure where it comes from, but main is not the first function that gets called. Uh, because if your program does dynamic linking or needs any libraries, other things need to happen. So there's actually other functions and other code that gets called before your main method gets called. Um, so this is essentially what happens. If somebody calls main, and it means it had a base pointer, and so main is just a function, right? We can have other functions. We can have call e, call back into main, right? There's no reason we can't do that. Um, so but yeah, it's so we It's not supposed to be D0, it's supposed to be C0. It's C0 is pretty arbitrary. Oh, arbitrary. It just means okay. that it needs to be something above us on the stack. Because okay. somebody, there was the base pointer was pointed, so, oh, you guys can't see when I go too far out. The base pointer was pointing somewhere up at the top of the stack above FD2D4. And so the first thing we do as main, because that's the calling convention, the callee has to save the base pointer before it uses it. Right, so it's pushing it onto the stack and then it's copying the stack pointer to the base pointer. Yeah. Is it C0 lower than D? So uh, no, no, because C. C is higher. Maybe C, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, yeah, it's a good point. Um, let's add another F here or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like way too difficult to fix these typos once these things are done. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it should be like E. 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 Okay. That's probably what I was going for. Yeah. Good. Yeah. See, it's a good thing this isn't actually a computer, right? It's a, it's a PowerPoint slide. Okay, anyway, okay, so what are the semantics of the call instruction? Yeah? So it, put, it does a jump there and it puts that memory location into the... <coughs> yeah, so this, so the parameter to this call instruction is the location that um, it wants to jump to, right? So think semantically. We need some way to call and jump to another function. Um, there's two, in assembly, there's kind of two types. There's a jump, a direct jump. So it just says, hey, always go here. Uh, call is also a direct jump, right? Because we always start executing at this uh, 80, 48, 3, 9, 4, which is the start of call E, right? We're going to always go there. But the side effect is we're going to push onto the stack the next instruction that would be executed after this call instruction. Right, so think of it, how does, so how many places do we have to store the instruction, the currently executing instruction, or the next, it should be the next executing instruction? One, we have one register, right? So if we go jump to some other code into this call E, what's the instruction pointer gonna be here? Right? The instruction pointer is going to be 80, 43, 48, 394, right? Because it's got to start executing in there. It's going to execute down. But how does it know to go back? Store it on the stack. Okay. Right, store it on the stack because we don't have an instruction pointer for that. Exactly. Um, so that's what the uh, call instruction does. It's like a two and one. So it, it starts executing there and it pushes uh, the next instruction onto the stack. Uh, so it's going to, I think, yeah, so when it pushes, right, it's going to actually decrement the stack pointer by four. 
then it's going to push the next instruction, and the next instruction here is uh, AD483BF, and then it's going to set the EIP, the instruction pointer, to AD48394, which means it's going to be pointing here. So this is the next instruction that's going to be executed. Any questions on that? Right, so this is just, it's, it actually is, it's just another example of the base pointer, right? Somebody's got to save it because we need a new one when we're executing this new function. So you just have to set up who saves it. In this case, the caller pushes the return value onto the stack, which also makes sense because it's the one that knows where execution should go to when that function returns. Questions? Okay, so then what's the first thing we need to do in the new function? What was that? Yeah, we need to save the function that just called this base pointer, right? Because we're about to overwrite it because we want our own base pointer. Exactly, so uh, which part, what is, are these two lines in the, so these two lines are identical, right, in main and call e. So what are these, what do we, what do we call these? Prolog. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, I always get them mixed up. So I guess I need to read more books. Uh, yeah, so the prolog here is everything that deals with the calling convention that when it gets called has to do, and then the epilogue is everything that has to happen to exit that function. Okay, so we're going to push EVP onto the stack, which says what to the base pointer? Decrements by four, which moves it where? Down. Yeah, we're going to move it down to put the base pointer onto the stack. So it's going to be moved down. The base pointer is going to be pointing to B0. And then we're going to put the current base pointer, which is FD2D0, onto the stack. And then we go to the next instruction. And here is where we set up our base pointer and say, OK, we're getting called. We need to set up our own frame, our own base pointer. So we let's move the stack pointer into the base pointer. Uh, so now both the stack pointer and the base pointer, right, are pointing here at 2B0. And so the only way we have to get back that base pointer, right, is here on the stack. Right? And so does everybody kind of see how um, we have the frame before main's base pointer is saved on the stack, and main's base pointer is saved on the stack. So each piece of these frames is, is on the stack. And so all that information is stored on the stack. So that way, when we return to that function, we can, uh, we can make sure that everything is right before we called it. OK. We're going to move EVP plus C into EAX. So what's EVP plus C? This is like the, the easiest of the hex addition you could do. What's zero plus C? C. So EBP is now B0. So what's that BC? Uh, 40, right? The value 28. So how does it know uh, C? How does it know to go up C? What was that? Because I told it to in one instruction. Did I write any of this code? No, I don't care. I, as a C programmer, I don't care about um, pointer, or I do care about pointers. Uh, I don't care about registers and stacks and all that stuff, right? I don't, I don't care about that. It's the first parameter in the callee list. It's the 40 is, I think, the second parameter. The second parameter. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, but why, so, yeah. Things are four bytes. Things are four bytes. Yeah, so it always does those four bytes. But why C? Because that's four bytes for me. Why eight? Because that's four bytes for the last place. So okay, let's let's get let's talk about one thing first. We talked about um, 
local variables, where are they offset from EVP? Negative or positive? Down the stack, or negative. Down the stack, negative, right? It makes sense, or when we move the stack pointer down, we're essentially allocating space on the stack from the base pointer down here. So our base pointer used to be up here. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet. We can sneak ahead and see that minus four EVP here, uh, which would be minus four here, that's our value A, our local variable A. So that's local on the stack is negative. So why, so then, um, what are these? Why positive, yeah? Almost, yeah. So we need to, so uh, kind of where you define EVP is pretty arbitrary. Right? You just have to make sure you're consistent, right? So really, this frame starts here in some sense, right? Because everything from here to the bottom of the stack is important to call E, right? There are the parameters. Um, and then there's the return value, which isn't really important to the computation. And then there's the base pointer. So the important thing is, is that the compiler knows, OK, I know I want to access, let's say, the first parameter. Or in this case, the second parameter of the function. So for my current base pointer that I know I just set up here, what's, what's four above me? Or what's, I guess, uh, what's at the base pointer? Was it? The previous base pointer. Yeah, the previous base pointer. And then what's above that? Not yet. What's this? Is this a parameter? No, it's the instruction to return to, right? So the saved EIP. And then what's above that? Parameters. The first parameter, exactly. And then, so eight up the stack is the first parameter. And then eight plus the size of the first parameter is going to be the second parameter. And Eight plus the size of the first parameter plus the size of the second parameter is the third parameter, um, and so on. And so the, the compiler knows, hey, I can compile this function. And since we're speaking the same calling convention, I know exactly how to calculate that offset. Because I know exactly what the stack's going to look like. I may not know the exact values. right? I'll never know what the saved EIP is on the stack. But I know those first four bytes above, the, above EDP are going to be the saved base pointer. And the four bytes above that are going to be the saved instruction pointer. And then above that are my parameters. And so it can calculate all that, right? It's not going to change. And so that's what the caller, what main did was it pushed, it created this stack by putting 28 and, and A on the stack in this order so that the callee knew how to find it. Yeah? So if a compiler learns how many parameters are being input from a function during compile time, Yes, it, it doesn't learn, it looks at it, right? So just like uh, you're looking at, um, you're looking at your parsing structure, right? Just like uh, with Hindley Milner type checking, right? With our tree, we can see, hey, this is a call, this is a function call, and what's the name of the function? Okay, foo is on the left, and I know exactly how many number of parameters they are, and then I can type check that to make sure there does exist a function foo with that many parameters. Uh, and then once I know that, that that function does exist, then I can create this code here to call that. Any other questions? Okay, then we're gonna move, okay, so we're gonna move um, 0xc, so we're gonna move 28 into eax. Um, okay, so yeah, this is where I have the, um, so basically, here is everything on the stack that belongs to main, right? This is main's frame on the stack. And yes, the base pointer points, main's base pointer points at D0. Um, so really, you kind of got to think about, well, what, what things is it responsible for? Similarly, like call E, right? Pretty much everything here belongs to call E. So these are the parameters, uh, the local variables, if there are any. Um, and all that stuff. So any questions on that? And so you can think about it conceptually while they're being called, right? Is it's literally a stack with all these frames on top of it so you get to the currently executed function. So is it 
possible to access from Kali mains parents base pointer? You add a certain amount to the stack for the voice base pointer and it would go up the stack. Right, so we know our Kali's base pointer, right? So if we can get to our parameters, right, we can get to the save base pointer. Right, it's actually at EBP. So we could get that value. We go look up that value. Where does that point to? Previous base pointer. Yeah, the previous base pointer up here at D0, right? And then we could actually grab um, main's parent's base pointer. You can actually walk up the stack. So um, anyways, so yeah, it's, uh, it'll come up later, probably in a week, but, um, but yeah, so all these things are saved. So because you know they're all at fixed offsets of an EDP, as soon as you get to a base pointer, you know how to find the save base pointer, and then you could go to that base pointer, and you could get to that save base pointer, all that fun stuff. Okay, so we're gonna move um, OX28 into EAX, which we've, which we've just done, and now we're gonna increment the instruction pointer. Now we're gonna move EBP plus eight into EDX. EBP plus eight is, as the value? Was it? Was it? OXA. OXA, hex A, yeah, so 10. So we're gonna move 10 into EDX. And now we have this fancy load effective address, which is essentially gonna add EDX to EAX and store the result in EAX. Uh, so that's going to add hex 28 plus hex A. Anybody know what that is off the top of their head? Anybody know what it is in decimal? 50? Yeah, so whatever 50 is in hex, which is 32, is that right? Sure. Yeah. Good. Perfect. All right. Uh, so let me move the instruction pointer onto the next one. Now we're adding one. Why, is, why this add one? It's part of the C code. What was it? It's part of the C code. It's part of the C code, yeah, exactly. So we're still in the code of our function, right? Our function was return A plus B plus one. Uh, so here we've got A, we've got B, or actually we've got B and then we've got A, and then we're adding one, to, we added them together. Now we're adding one to that. And we stored it in EAX. Why did we store it in EAX? Right, so we're returning this A plus B plus one, and for our calling convention, that A is, um, EAX is the register where we pass back values. Exactly, okay. So then we pop EDP, so what's this uh, gonna do semantically? Put the base pointer back to main's base pointer. Yeah, so it's gonna, Put, so it's going to put the base pointer back to main's base pointer. So why do we have to do that? Why does the main do that? Yeah, so the, the, the real answer is, well, that's what the calling convention says. So we're the ones who saved the base pointer. It means that we better put it back before main returns. Otherwise, main's going to think it's base pointer somewhere else, and all uh, everything's going to break. Um, so yeah, we're going to pop EDP, right? So we're going to uh, take the value on the stack pointer, put it in EDP, and then what are we going to do to the stack? Move it which direction? Up. Yeah, so we're popping, right? So we're pop taking that value, putting it into a register, and moving the stack up. So we are going to take uh, D0, put it into EBP, which we've done. Then we're going to increment the stack pointer by 4. So now the stack pointer now points at B4. All right, then we move on to the next instruction. Now here, ret. So what is the ret semantics? Return. Return, yes. Um, very good. Uh, <laughs> So semantically for the program, I mean for the assembly, right? So I'll tell you this, it's the essentially the dual of call. So we need to restore the instruction pointer as well. Say it again? We need to restore the instruction pointer. Right. 
because we're done executing, right? We need to go back to whoever called us. Do we know where to go? Yeah, we know because it's on the stack, right? But we don't know just offhand because we could have been called from anywhere, right? We could even have called ourselves, so we may be jumping back to the start of this function. <coughs> so the semantics here are, um, let's see. Oh, I think it's pretty easy, actually. Pop, uh, pop the value currently on the, uh, pop into EIP. I think it's equivalent to that. Um, so take the stack pointer, take the value of the stack pointer, put it into the instruction pointer and, in, and move the stack up. So by putting it into the instruction pointer, we'll now start executing at whatever the value was that was in here. Which is where? What's, what's uh, 80483BS? Yeah, the next instruction after call, right? Which is exactly what we want. We want, we want to call this callee function, and then we want to do something, and then we want to come back right after when we called it. Uh, so that's how this works. So ret is going to take that value, put it into EIP, then it's going to uh, increment the stack pointer, move the stack pointer up, and now the next instruction we're going to execute is going to be here uh, right after this call instruction. Questions on how that works? Okay. So then we're going to move EAX into EDP minus 4. So what's in EAX? The return value. The return value. Well, what is it? We actually know what it is. Well, it's here, right? It's uh, 51, right? So we're going to move EAX into EDP minus 4. Uh, where is EDP minus 4 on here? One down from the base pointer, so here. Yeah, so we should move 33 into there. So that's good. Uh, oh, and so that would be at FD2CC, in case you were wanting to follow along. OK, then we're going to move minus 4 EBP into EAX. So what's minus 4 EBP? Yeah, address where we just stored into 33. We're going to move that into EAX. Why are we doing that? What did main return? A. Yeah, so it returns the value A, which is the return from that function call. Right? So uh, where does main put its return value? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's the calling convention. It doesn't matter if you're the main function. It doesn't matter. Any function has to follow those uh, standards. Uh, so we're going to take that value, put it into EAX, which as you can probably see, does nothing, changes nothing. Um, okay, and then we're going to call the leave instruction, where the leave instruction is this compound instruction that sets uh, the stack pointer to the current base pointer. So basically gets rid of anything we've done on the stack. So set the stack pointer to the current base pointer. And then pops, e the pops into EBP. So take whatever's currently on the stack, take that value, put it in EBP, and move the stack up. So essentially, this is uh, getting rid of these two, push EBP and move ESP to EBP. Right? So essentially, we're first moving the base pointer into the stack pointer. So that gets rid of this one, right? So we're first, um, we're going to set the stack pointer to be D0, which is going to move the stack all the way up to the base pointer. And then we're going to pop that value from the base pointer into, uh, sorry, we're going to pop the value that's currently on the stack into EBP, which is doing what? Resetting the base pointer for who? Whoever called main, exactly. We don't know what it is, but we're going to put it back there because we're good functions. And so it'll be at C0, and then we increment the stack up 4, right, because we just popped. So now the stack's going to be up here. So is the, uh, is the stack where we left it? Yeah, I sure hope so, right? We started, when we started in main, the stack was at D4. And so right before we leave, you know, it's got to be there. So what's this ret going to do? Uh, set the instruction pointer to whatever the base pointer is. 
uh, not the base pointer. So it's, it's basically a pop EIP. So take whatever's on the stack, put it in the instruction pointer, and start executing there and move the stack up. So remember we did that here to get back from our function call e. Right? So right, somebody called main, so we need to return to whoever called us. Uh, so that's how we're going to do this return. Is there's, we, don't, we don't see it here because to main's perspective, it doesn't matter what's there. We're just going to jump to it and start executing it. All right. So any questions on this example of parameter passing and function calls and frames? And, yeah. Um, so as you go from one instruction to the next, how does EIP know the uh, address of the next instruction? Ah, so how does EIP know the address of the next instruction? Uh, so on MIPS, how do you know the address of the next instruction? They're all the same size. Right, so they're all the same size. So it's always, what, four bytes or something like that, depending on your MIPS system. Um, so here, x86, as you can maybe tell by the offsets here, there are variable size instructions. Right, so some instructions, like you can see, if you look at the differences between these, right, this means that the push instruction is only one byte, whereas the move ESP to EBP is two bytes, um, and so on and so forth. There can be really long instructions. Uh, the whole point is that it knows. So all of this stuff is built into the processor. So it knows when it's decoding an instruction. So it has this whole step where it first decodes an instruction. So basically starting with a bunch of bytes, how many of these are the next instruction? And then once you figure out what the instruction is, then you know exactly what the next value is going to be. So yeah, it's, it's one of the stages in the pipeline is instruction deep, like instruction fetch, instruction decode. Uh, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah? As soon as we return from call E, we don't care about the parameters that we pass to it anymore, right? Correct. So, but we didn't pop those off the stack, right? Is there any reason why we just let them, you know, sit there? What if we wanted to, we're wasting two bytes, you know? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. I, I kind of think it's something to do with GCC doing some sort of optimization. Like, I didn't go in and say no optimizations. Um, but, so it's, got, it's doing some. And that's why I think it first, so the other thing is, right, it's, it's moving, it's reserving 24 bytes on the stack. And it's using that space that it reserved to pass these, these parameters in. So it's not reserving space for its local variables and then pushing the, the right, the rightmost parameter, and then pushing the leftmost parameter, um, and then calling the function. So why it's doing that, I honestly don't know. I think it's probably an optimization where it looked at it and was like, oh, I can, like, I don't ever need these bytes again, so I can just move the stack down, copy them in right there. Um, yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure, but it is, it's interesting. Um, the other thing is, you look at it and think, well, compilers should be smart, right? And then you look at these two instructions. Right, which, so why, so I guess this is a good time to talk about it. So why would, uh, say why would the compiler maybe want to leave those in here? Yeah. Yeah, so what if, okay, so what if I call the, so yeah, okay, so I guess it, it does depend on kind of what you're saying is what the compiler can look at, right? I mean, I guess you can say as a human, you could probably just optimize, remove both of these values. Essentially optimize out that local variable A and just say return. Because you know nobody uses that value A, right? But is that always true, right? Is the program, what if it's in a multi-threaded environment where there's somebody has a reference to this value A and is counting on it to be set? Um, I guess it's highly unlikely that it happened in our example, but it could happen, right? You could have even, um, I mean, this is a bad example, but you could have memory mapped I.O. in some cases, so you actually really want that memory address to be written to, and if it doesn't happen, then your program breaks and your semantics are all out of whack. Um, yeah, so it, I think it does it to be safe, but I think it would be interesting to look at it as you increase the optimization levels, whether it would get rid of it or not. Any other questions? Yeah. So once um, all this is done executing, everything that's below uh, the base pointer is literally just garbage at that point. We don't yeah. need to do anything. With exactly. It. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the, the beauty of it, right? So as soon as the program terminates, the OS just gets rid of this memory, right? It doesn't need it at all. Um, because, so this is why 
you have to, you really want to, um, C doesn't force you to, but you really should set your variable, you want to declare or uh, assign to your variables before you use them, right? Because you can't ever assume, right? It just, C is a very low level language. It just translates it directly uh, to assembly instructions here. So for instance, if you were accessing a local variable before assigning to it, you're going to get whatever garbage happened to be in that memory, which is dependent on the stack layout. So you don't have to worry about, I think you have to worry about another program getting your stack or something. Um, but yeah, you pretty much, you just leave it. It doesn't matter if it's there. Cool, any other questions? All right, okay, so we kind of looked at this. So how did the previous, so let's talk about some semantics for a little bit. So how did the previous example pass parameters to that function call e? Yeah? Push them on the stack in the right absolutely. Yeah, it pushes the values on the stack. So what does that mean semantic-wise? When you see like a function call in C, what does that mean semantically that you're thinking about when calling a function? So if you pass a variable A, a local variable A to a function <coughs> as, as the actual parameter, in the function, that formal parameter, what does it get? So yeah, it gets, it gets the value and the location associated with A, but it gets that value, right? So can it change A? No, right? Um, is that the only way you could do it? What about uh, C++ passing by reference? Right, so yeah, there's multiple approaches to parameter passing, and specifically the semantics of parameter passing. Uh, one is what we call pass by value, so that's what you're used to. So that's, you take the value and the location associated with the uh, actual parameter and you put that value in the location associated with the formal parameter. The other one is pass by reference, like in C++. So here, you're, well, we'll get to it in a second, but you're binding the actual parameter to the same location, the formal parameter to the same location as the actual parameter. And finally, pass by name, which is really crazy. And it's kind of just something to show you as to how far you can push a crazy language semantics. Okay, so for pass by value, so this is very, yeah? Isn't it pass by address? I thought there was pass by reference, pass by address, pass by value. Uh, pass by address, I'd probably say, is another name for pass by reference. Okay. Um, because. Yeah, I mean, it all depends when you're on passing a pointer. The other, you're passing like you could just use the variable name. Uh, but when you're passing in a pointer, you're copying the value, right? What is it? What's in the value of a pointer? Address. Address. An address, right? So when you pass, when you're using pass by value semantics, when you pass in a pointer to a function, you're copying that value inside the pointer, which is an address, into the location. So pass by value. Yes. Huh. Yes. The. The effects can be the same, right? It can be similar as if you did pass by reference. Okay. But the semantics are that you're actually copying that value. Okay, and so here, the values of the actual parameters at function invocation are calculated, right? Because it may not be a, you know, you don't have to pass a variable as an actual parameter. It can have an expression, right? An arbitrary expression. And it's copied to the function. Uh, so we've seen in precise detail about how this is done for C, and um, that, so in that example, right, copies of those values were placed onto the stack. Okay, so let's look at an example that has some garbage answers here. Okay, uh, so we have an integer x, we have a main function, this main function has a local variable y, we call the function test y, and then we print out the value of f, uh, the value of y, sorry, and then we return y. So in our function test, takes in as its formal parameter x. So, um, so when we refer to x in this function, which x are we referring to? One right after test. Uh, the one right after test. Right. So I guess one thing are we talking about static or dynamic scoping? But here, uh, 
that answer doesn't really matter. But here we're talking strictly static scoping. Uh, so this x refers to the parameter x, right? that formal parameter x. And so here we're going to add 5 to x, and we're going to print out the value of x. Okay, so when we run this, so is this going to type check? Okay, uh, what's the value when we run it if I could somehow block out some of those floating numbers? So why is 9 going to be printed out? Because there's a print declaration in test. Because there's a print declaration in test. And so what's this printf printing out? The parameter x behind test. The parameter x, the value of x, right? And so we pass in 4 to test. We add 5 to that. 4 plus 5 is 9. And then, so we print out 9. And then when test returns, how come y wasn't changed? Right, it's passed by value. So we took the value that was in y, and we passed it as x. Uh, so here, going back to our box circle diagrams, right? So here in main, we have the variable y which is bound to some location, and what's the value inside this location? Four. Four, Four exactly. Uh, then when test is called, right, we have its formal parameter is named x. So it has a name x, it's bound to some location, and so what's the value that gets, so what happens when we invoke test? Yeah, we copy the value that's in the location associated with the actual parameter, which is y, we're going to take that value, place it in the, the location, the value of the location associated with the formal parameter x. So here we're going to put it in here. And then when we execute um, this x is equal to x plus 5, we're going to increment this x here, right? Because this is the local x. We're going to say that that's 9. And then what happens when, uh, so we're going to print out 9. Then what happens when test returns? X gets destroyed, or what's another word for destroyed? Deallocated. Yeah, exactly. OK, so it goes away, and now we have Y. So we print out Y, and Y has the value 4. All right, and uh, yeah, so we'll, on Wednesday, we'll start off with pass by reference. Thank you.